What's up everybody? This is the 2023 Ford Escape plug-in hybrid. So about the plug-in hybrid version of the Escape. Well, all Escapes got a refresh for the 2023 model year, and I am filming this in 2024, but Ford just happened to send me a 2023. But for 2024, there's really no changes, so uh, it's all gonna be the same. And anyway, I think it's a really nice refresh here. I really like the sharper headlights. It's really a handsome look with that new grille and you know the other slight tweaks to the bumper. And I really like how that LED light extends all the way through the grille as well. And I think I think it's a really nice refresh up front here. I also really like the smaller proportions of the Escape compared to some other SUVs in this compact SUV segment that have grown. This one is actually one of the smaller ones I think these days and uh, kind of gives it a nice more compact easier to park kind of you know vibe and uh, I think it looks really good. You know, on the sides here, you have the uh, charge port here in the front. That's the one way you can tell you're looking at a plug-in hybrid version of the Escape, of course. And you have some 18-inch wheels that look pretty nice. And then going out to the back there, they also got some new taillights. You have the Escape script that's new there across the tailgate and some other minor little tweaks there to the back end. But otherwise, you know, it still looks mostly the same. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's the most distinctive looking thing in this segment. There's certainly some bolder options in the plug-in hybrid segment as well if you do want something a little more eye-catching. But I think this nicely blends in has an attractive look that I think will age well. And overall, I think they did a good job here on this refresh as far as the styling goes. The interior of the 2023 Escape also gets a nice refresh here as well. The main thing is just this giant screen. It's a 13.2 inch touchscreen. It also replaces the HVAC controls and you have that as a permanent little bar at the bottom of the screen at all times, regardless of what you're doing on the screen. But it has wireless Apple CarPlay, wireless Android Auto. And it's one of the biggest CarPlay displays in this segment. Uh, and it's really impressive. Just, you know, all the features in the screen are all really nice i like you know the power flow and you have various drive modes uh you know which do take a couple of taps to get to unfortunately there's not just like a quick little button to do it but um you know just lots of good stuff there in that screen and it's pretty quick whenever you first start it up it's a little slow for the first you know 15 to 30 seconds but then after that it's been totally fine it's been reliable it's worked pretty well and overall i think it's actually a really nice improvement and does put this at the top as far as tech for this segment i believe just as far as screen real estate goes aside from that big change the only other thing here is you have these quilted leather seats uh, which have the micro perforations and uh, they're pretty nice looking although I wish they were perforated all the way through uh, but uh, you know they're also heated only there's no cooling here even in this fully loaded version and that is something a lot of competitors will give you cooled seats and this does not um, also some of the materials in here are still kind of cheap for the money this one being almost fifty thousand dollars as tested I mean you have like some pretty cheap door panels here now the armrest parts really nice and has a complete different material than what you have on the door panel here but um, you know with stuff like even a Mitsubishi Outlander having beautiful soft quilted leather here on the door panels this just doesn't fly these days um, you also like for example by the way this charging pad I guess this is supposed to be easy to remove for cleaning but it's really just like cheap and flimsy and doesn't feel very secure in there and uh, you know hard plastic down by your knees where again the Mitsubishi has you know padding and it's not great so I mean tech is good you know you have digital gauges fully digital gauges here and all the plug-in hybrid versions which is a nice touch as well and you have the Vista panoramic roof here which which is a really great touch and you know there are some things here for example like that a honda crv doesn't offer so i mean it still has some nice stuff but uh you know compared to the best competitors in this segment you know the tucson plug-in hybrid outlander plug-in hybrid sportage plug-in hybrid and the rav4 prime outside of the screen sizes you know everything else in here just feels a little lower rent one other little thing though i do want to compliment the vehicle on is this bang and olsen stereo you this bno stereo it's a 10 speaker stereo it's an optional upgrade here this giant premium package that's 4500 on these escape uh, uh, plug-in hybrids and um, so that's one of the things you get and that is actually a really nice sounding stereo the base stereo is a six speaker this is 10 and as actually I was really impressed with the sound quality one other little thing though I want to mention before I go is that uh, you have this head-up display and some other competitors also have a head-up display but they have real head-up displays that actually project onto the windshield this is this little pop-up screen that you know makes it feel like you're wearing bifocals or something it's just bizarre and uh, kind of old and outdated so just again odd little things here about the escape that uh, you know I don't love but you know I mean like backseat space is still pretty good even for a vehicle this size cargo space is pretty good you have a spare tire under the floor there even with this being a a plug-in hybrid with a battery pack and all that so there are certainly some other nice components to it for sure but uh you know it just unfortunately this interior does not feel worthy of its price tag and most of the competitors do feel worthy of their price tag or even better than their price tag but if you'd like to hear more info on the interior of the escape my wife and i did a full in-depth interior review on the escape whenever this generation first came out and leg room and you know everything else is going to be the same aside from again this new screen in the middle um so definitely check out that video i'll link it at the end of this one
one if you want to hear all the details on this interior. But let's start up and go for a drive. The Escape Plug-in Hybrid uses the same old Ford key they've had for a good long while now. It's a little bit on the thicker side. It's not one of my favorite keys out there, but it works totally fine. You have some nice uh, metal looking buttons there on the back. So, I mean, it looks nice, but uh, just a little, little big these days. But anyway, of course, this keyless access, keyless entry, push button start here, and the Plug-in Hybrid Escape. So you just leave the key in your pocket, hit the engine start button, and it turns right on. All right, so setting off here in the Escape plug-in hybrid. So the first thing you notice about it, well, the first thing you'll probably notice is that, that if you have some electric charge on the battery or if you're going at low speeds, it'll operate as either a hybrid, you know, just in electric mode, or if you have some charge there in the battery, then it'll be completely electric. It will default to an electric now mode. There's a bunch of different drive modes here um, where you can either generate electricity if you want with a gas engine, you can save the battery, uh, you know, power for whenever you want to use it at a later date, or, you know, you can also just have it primarily, you know, deplete that battery first. There's also an auto mode which will try and switch off you know I guess when it thinks it is best and uh, so you know cruising here it's nice and quiet you just hear that you know a uh, mandated you know sound that it has to emit to alert pedestrians of your arrival uh, you know but aside from that um, totally quiet and it's you know a nice smooth ride for the most part I don't think it's the softest riding plug-in hybrid in this segment but um, you know it's been totally fine here and whenever you are over some rough bumps it can be a little more uh, you know jarring than some of the competitors but overall I don't really have any problems with the ride there are a few interesting things though you'll notice right away um, first off is that the brakes have a little bit of a tricky feel to them where the last like 10 to 15 percent of travel they get a little sticky and they, they stop a little faster than you're wanting it just takes a little bit of a learning curve the first couple of days I was pretty rough with uh, my slowdowns you definitely have to finesse it uh, but after a few days I did get the hang of it and now I'm not really doing jerky stops as often as I was before but just you know a little bit more of a learning curve than most of the other plug-in hybrid competitors that do have better blended brake pedals that feel more natural Natural. Uh, other things, the steering is strangely heavy and it just adds to this whole vehicle itself feeling heavy since with this battery pack and still just only being front wheel drive, these are still over 4,000 pounds for the curb weight. And uh, you know, so it just, the steering weight is unnecessarily heavy. I haven't encountered steering this heavy in a crossover like this um, since the Mazdas, uh, in particular the CX-50, which had really heavy steering for some bizarre reason. Um, this is pretty close to that, but this, honestly, the Mazda had better feel because even though it was heavy, it was really nice feeling. This is heavy and also a little rubbery at times and just doesn't feel super good to use, to be totally honest. I mean, again, it's fine, but it's just like, this is a plug-in hybrid crossover. I don't know why they thought they needed heavy steering. You don't need it to feel sporty or anything. So why they decided to do this just to give owners an extra arm workout just seems you know, kind of confusing to me but um, you know other things though visibility is pretty good here you know you have nice thin a pillars great view forward view out of the sides is good view out of the back is great and so you know for all those reasons it's you know gonna be totally fine as far as you know just driving around it also has the auto park 2.0 that's available here in this premium package which will help you to do the parallel parking automatically you have 360 cameras all that kind of stuff to help you out but I'm gonna go ahead and go into the drive modes here which are unfortunately again are in the screen I'm gonna put into these Sport mode. Now I did run the engine uh, before I started filming this video, so the engine is in stone cold. So we're in sport mode, um, and uh, let's turn down onto this back road here. It already just kicked on the engine here, and let's see how it accelerates. Here we go. CVT transmission doing its thing. Uh, just kind of you know holding it close to that red line there, and then that's basically it. I mean, so. As far as the performance here, now this is gonna be one of the slowest plug-in hybrids in this segment. I think it is the slowest actually. Uh, just has 210 horsepower total, which is strangely 11 less horsepower than the pre-refresh version. I'm not sure why they got a power downgrade, uh, but you know, so 210 horsepower combined, it's uh, all done thanks to a two and a half liter Atkinson cycle nationally aspirated four cylinder engine. Uh, that alone does 163 horsepower, and then there's two e-motors that help you out up front there as well. But it's only front wheel drive here in the Escape plug-in hybrids there's no all-wheel drive option strangely and I believe it's the only front-wheel drive uh, compact uh, plug-in hybrid here uh, as far as SUVs goes uh, which is also strange since all the other competitors offer all-wheel drive that really puts the escape at a disadvantage if you live in a place that ever sees any kind of weather but uh, yeah I think car and driver got like a 7.7 .7 seconds here to 60 times so you know it's okay it's fine and with the electric punch you know you do get a nice little jolt 
you know, but you still gotta wait for the engine to like do a downshift, which is kind of strange considering it is like a variable transmission. Uh, but it does actually feel like it has some pretty defined, uh, you know, shifting going on. So the bottom line is just know that this is gonna be less power than all the competitors offer. If having the most power doesn't matter to you and not having all wheel drive doesn't matter to you, this is still a totally fine powertrain. I think it'll be great, you know, for the average driver that's just looking for something that's economical and still has, you know, a decent amount of punch for commuting. But anyway, counting off some corners here that I always take and let's see how the Escape plug-in hybrid handles. So we're just on 225 wide, Michelin Primacy all-season tires, so nothing sporty. Um, and you know, there's a little bit of lean here. Honestly, I think body roll is fairly well controlled though, in my opinion. And uh, you know, it's not too bad. The steering, I don't know, surprisingly, it didn't get any heavier in sport mode. Usually sport mode does make steering heavier in most vehicles, but in this, not the case. Um, so, you know, I don't really know. I guess sport mode just makes it a little bit more aggressive with the throttle response maybe. But outside of that, um, you know, this feels pretty normal. But I do have to say that, you know, compared to, again, most of the competitors, I'd say that this doesn't handle any better than any of the others. And I think that my favorite handling one on the segment, the Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid, handles much better than this does. It is so much more dynamic. It was a blast to take around corners. This will do it, um, you know, but it's certainly not as enjoyable as it is in the Outlander. And honestly, I think even the RAV4 Prime and the Tucson Sports, I think they all kind of are a little lighter on their feet than this feels. Again, I think a lot of this is just the way, again, they ramped up this steering weight. And uh, so I don't, don't love the way it handles, but to me, it's totally fine. Some others have said it's like really feels heavy and like, like it's not great. I don't think it's quite as bad as some of the reviews have made it out to be, to be honest, but uh, certainly, again, still is comfortably probably bottom of the pack as far as plug-in hybrid compact crossovers goes. Also, we're on this road that sometimes generates some more road noise here. And, uh, you know, road noise, is I'd say a little bit higher than some of the competitors as well, but I'd say it's, you know, again, pretty average for a vehicle in this segment. So, you know, no big issues there. Uh, but the other thing that's important to mention, of course, about a plug-in hybrid is the battery pack and all that. So it runs a 10.7 kilowatt hour battery. So that's a little bit smaller than most of the other competitors, but it still does a pretty impressive 37 miles of electric range is what it's rated at. And um, so, I mean, obviously only driving two front wheels instead of all four wheels is how it's able to, you know, use less battery and yet have really impressive range. It's Right up there, not quite best in class, but you know, pretty close. With um, you know, only the RAV4 Prime, I think, doing more, you know, 42 miles of range in that one. But um, you know, this is going to be more than like the Tucson and the Sportage, which I believe do about 33 miles of electric range. So, I'm driving this vehicle in the middle of winter, though, where obviously batteries don't perform as well and you got to run the heat and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, there's just you know, some downgrades to electric vehicle performance in cold weather. And so, my observed range, I did do a full charge and I got about 20. 8 miles of electric range. Now, a lot of that was primarily highway driving. Maybe I would have got a little bit more if I was doing some, you know, stop and go kind of stuff in the electric mode, but it was primarily highway, just straight, you know, cruise control cruising. But even still, I'd say that, you know, yes, you lose out on, you know, nine miles of range here in the winter, but that's not too bad, especially considering it's a plug-in hybrid. The beauty of plug-in hybrids is you have the gas engine to back you up, uh, but just know that, you know, you're not going to hit that, you know, range rating, um, you know, if you're doing any kind of higher speed driving or winter driving or both. And it's also really fast with the recharge since it's, you know, a smaller battery as well, just on a regular 110, plug it into a normal wall out outlet um, like I do at my house um, you know it was able to recharge itself I believe and it was like maybe eight hours or so it was really quick um, considering you know it's not a fast charger by any means but um, you know, it's great that it does that. There's no fast charging capabilities or anything with this, which I think makes sense anyway, because it'd be a waste to include, you know, because it's such a small battery. But I'm going to go ahead and put it back into the normal mode here, and I'm going to go to the strictly electric driving mode once again, uh, because I want to show how this vehicle performs whenever you are just in the electric mode, because obviously, you know, you don't have a ton of power from these electric motors. And so let's see... Um, it also, there's one other funny thing. It, it, there's a weird little pop-up that happens on the gauge cluster here I'll get to in a second, but we're merging onto the highway here, so I'm gonna talk about this first. So let's turn down here, and we do have some traffic and stuff, so this isn't a zero to 60 run by any means, but... So interestingly, like whenever you go foot to the floor, it won't turn on the gas engine, but it does have a pop-up in the gauge cluster here that says enable engine for additional performance or whatever. And you have to hit okay, and then it will give it permission to turn on the gas engine. Otherwise it will not, um, which is kind of strange because, you know, again, it's not a ton of power. 
and you know it just seems like it would be something that most other vehicles that this competes with have like a kick down switch at the bottom of the gas pedal where it's like okay well now you want everything and it just takes that matter matters into its own hands which I think is the better way to do it so you don't have to have an extra step if you're in an emergency situation where you need to get out of someone's way or something you know it's kind of strange to make people confirm it with an okay on the steering wheel um, but anyway you know so I mean but I'm doing all the electric driving here I got up to speed just fine I'm you know cruising here uh, at highway speed it's no problem whatsoever and it's so I mean, it's a very capable uh, you know electric mode I was doing you know higher highway speeds uh, earlier this week in this no problem and uh, you know it was doing a really good job so it is like you know fully capable of being a complete EV for those first 37 odd miles um, if you are able to plug it in every night so it is you know an impressive amount of punch now it's not going to be super impressive you know I think the RAV4 Prime is still my favorite as far as the most punch with its electric motors but I'd say that even all the others that I've experienced um, I don't believe there's an EV only mode in the Tucson and the Sportage but whenever I did that in the Outlander um, it was also you know pretty punchy in that but the RAV4 Prime I mean you can do full-blown like 0 to 60s in that and I mean it'll like still be really punchy in that electric mode so that's still definitely the best one uh, if you want to do the best electric driving possible but um yeah, this is doing totally fine and we can also while we're out here uh, try out the uh, adaptive cruise control system it also does have a lane keep assist system and basically all the safety stuff in this vehicle comes standard uh, because you're getting the plug-in hybrid version which again starts very high and the uh, you know escape hierarchy but as far as other safety tech goes you know you have everything as standard so blind spot monitoring rear cross traffic alert automatic emergency braking both for the front and for the rear uh, all that stuff is standard you have the lane keep assist is standard the park assist 2 0.0 is one of the few things you have to pay extra for with this giant premium package it's forty five hundred dollars that gives you um, the head-up display the leather the better stereo uh, and a couple other things um, you know so but that's it otherwise all the other safety stuff is standard here on the plug-in hybrids which certainly keeps it nice and simple and it's great that they include all that stuff as standard but uh, you know I actually tested out the lane keep assist system here on some windier highways earlier this week and uh, it actually does a really good job Ford's lane keep assist system is really good it's unfortunate we don't have the blue cruise system available like you get in the f-150 and the mach-e but uh, you know it still is nice to have a really good lane keep assist system and it's been giving me confidence steering assist and also having the head display is really nice too because it will you know let you know when it's keeping track of the road lines and when it isn't it does a pretty good job of alerting you because there were I think one or two times where it did lose track of those lines on me but uh, at least it kept me really well notified of that this has been trustworthy and uh, been pretty good assistance but um, otherwise you know just cruising on the highway here nice and quiet again in the electric mode here and uh, speaking of electric mode too that is one thing so obviously the main thing if you're getting a plug-in hybrid you want to plug it in every night to get the most efficiency and to you know make the most of your purchase um, if you're not going to do that you might as well just get a regular hybrid version and save yourself a bunch of money but um, you know once you do deplete that battery since you know especially in the winter time here I was depleting it pretty quickly um, you know whenever it does go into the gas mode though I've been so impressed with just how much driving I was doing in electric mode even with a completely dead battery obviously it will still keep enough charge in the battery to still function as a hybrid still do that engine off off, you know cruising around at very low speeds no matter what but you know it's just impressive that I've been driving this vehicle now 113 and a half miles uh, you know a good amount of mileage here and it's telling me that basically 70% of those miles have been electric um, and so I as far as charge you know I got 28 miles on the first electric charge and then I plugged it in and got another 14 miles of charge uh, but I've only used uh, four of those miles um, so far because it's been you know again just regenerating a good bit there and having the engine in that sport mode is kicking on the gas engine and not really using that battery that much um, so basically just from my wall outlet I can attribute 32 of those miles to my own charging and the other you know almost 40 miles of electric driving were just done in the hybrid mode the vehicle just intelligently you know regening the battery on its own with braking and you know doing what it needs to do to be as efficient as possible and so you know that's uh, really impressive to me now as far as MPGs goes I think this is rated 101 MPGE which still seems like kind of an irrelevant rating that doesn't seem super helpful to be totally honest and you know your efficiency will come down to your driving style how often you're able to charge it how much you drive it beyond it's rated charge every day this comes down to your individual unique needs um, so you know 
MPG ratings are going to just come down to, you know, again, how much you're actually using the gas engine. But for whatever it's worth, just, uh, you know, to give you an idea, I guess, here, um, with all that context in mind of how much I charged and how much I drove, um, I've been getting 48.8 MPG all combined. So I think that's obviously the gas engine working. I think when the gas engine is working completely on its own, I've been seeing something in the high 20s typically on average. Uh, but, you know, then you factor in the electric driving and that boosts that, that average, uh, you know, MPG up there to about 49 or so. So I'd say this is just a very economical vehicle. And especially if you're someone who doesn't see weather, if you live in, you know, one of those sunny states and you just want a great plug-in hybrid, I think that there is a case to be made for the Escape. Um, and, you know, I think there's a place for front-wheel drive, you know, plug-in hybrid, you know, crossover. I think it's a great idea. And if you could boost that electric range, I'm surprised that the other manufacturers haven't offered something like this as well. A couple other quick observations about the Escape as well that I noticed during my week of living with it here. Uh, the first is that there's this weird like auto slowdown thing where it tries to intelligently regen on downhill sections um, and it's kind of strange it'll ease up as the you know decline is uh, decreasing and you know turning to flat land again so it is actively trying to manage that but it just means that uh, unless you're okay going slow downhills um, you know it's just gonna be kind of unnatural feeling and I had to keep overriding it with a gas pedal to be like no I don't want to like slow down to the speed limit whenever I'm going downhill like I want to you know do a few over or whatever and it just you know was always trying to you know slow me down a little bit and I couldn't find any way to disable that in the screen so that's kind of something if that annoys you definitely check that out on the test drive if that annoys you just keep in mind that I don't think there's any way to get rid of that and it is something that after a while can get on your nerves a couple other little minor things there's a rattle by the back door in this one this one's got about 10,000 miles on it there's a rattle by the back door I'm not sure if that's just this vehicle or what but make sure that the, if you're buying one of these that it's rattle free um, and then the other things to mention there's two funny little things the first is that this heated steering wheel it gets hot super fast which is great if you're you know winter time driving you're like oh man I'm you know really loving the fact that my hands get heated up really nice and fast the downside is that it doesn't stop heating up basically and so you'll have the heated steering wheel on and uh, it'll you know get nice and toasty but then there's been some times where it like gets scalding hot like so much that I have to like turn it off and then my hands get cold and then I gotta turn it back on I first world problems I know but it's like I think this is the hot hottest hot heated steering wheel that I've ever experienced where like I almost like I couldn't touch it it got so hot after a while and there should be some kind of temperature limiter to be like hey maybe we should like turn down the heating here so this steering wheel doesn't like combust on its own it's just kind of strange that like it got so hot um, the other strange thing is that this infotainment system I don't know if it's a lag in the system or what but every time I was listening to music you know most cars uh, either the music turns off when you turn off the ignition or the music turns off when you open the door but in this vehicle, uh, I, you know, was parked and then I would open up the door and it would keep playing my music for like a solid like 10 seconds before it would finally turn off. So what it meant was that, you know, sometimes I like listen to the music, you know, kind of loudly and I would like hop out of this vehicle and be like, no, 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 with the, the loud music. And I'm like, oh man, I gotta like remember to pause the music because I'm like opening my door and everyone's like hearing my music playing as I'm getting out of the vehicle. And it's the first vehicle I've ever had where it's like continuing to play music as I'm leaving the vehicle. So that was kind of strange. Not sure, you know, why it did that, but I just had to remember to be like, oh wait, I parked the vehicle. I better make sure I pause my music or turn it off, you know, before I get out. Otherwise, it's going to be just, uh, you know, boom boxing for everyone around me for the next 10 seconds when I get out of the vehicle. So that was kind of strange as well. But, uh, you know, just minor little nuisances. Nothing that's really a deal breaker, in my opinion, but just strange things that I don't have to put up with in any other competitors. But, um, you know, the really tough thing about the Escape, and really the last thing to mention, is the pricing and how this compares to the competition. And so, as far as the pricing goes, that's the biggest problem with the Escape. And uh, so, now this is a 2023 model year. The window sticker says it's about $47,115 as tested. Now, for 2024, for some inexplicable reason, since there's no improvements for 2024, um, it got a price increase of about almost $2,500. And so this one now, if it, you're getting a 2024 model year, is going to cost you uh, just under $50,000. It's like $49,730 or something. And that price makes it really tough uh, because you have the plug-in hybrid Tucson from Hyundai and the Sportage is very similar. Same vehicle underneath, pretty much. Both of those are like $46,500 roughly. And they have, again, a few miles less range, but you have more power, you have all-wheel drive, and, you know, it's just a 
there you get more you know aside from the screen being slightly smaller in those but not by much especially in the sportage it's a 12 inch screen so you're down an inch no one's gonna really care i think honestly um and so you know it just that's really the, the toughest competitor there is that now i will say you know as far as reliability goes you know ford is probably in my mind at least right behind toyota as far as their hybrid plug-in hybrid uh you know reliability because i think you know the hybrid system is the same basic hybrid system they've used in the escape hybrids for years that have been used as taxis and you know all kinds of cities all over the country and they run for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles pretty much without issue from what I've seen at least. And so I'm by no means an expert on hybrid uh, escape reliability, but it just seems like, you know, these things really hold up well to <laughs> lots of mileage, lots of abuse. Um, and so, you know, I mean, the others are I'm sure gonna be pretty reliable as well, but at least one thing with the Hyundai and the Kia is they do run a turbocharged four cylinder engine instead. A little bit more extra complication compared to the simpler naturally aspirated four cylinder here and this. And that's also, you know, Mitsubishi and Toyota elect to use a naturally aspirated four-cylinder as well and I think that you know those will probably be slightly more reliable as a result um, and so that's the only thing I will say about you know those two but otherwise you know the other things to mention is you know for only about $600 more expensive you can get the uh, Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid which is my favorite handling one of the bunch is the second most powerful one of the bunch so plush on the inside really nice materials everywhere you look and touch in the Outlander a little bit more space it even has a third row it's basically a jump seat but you know you have that extra capability it's a little bit of a larger vehicle it's a little more distinctive looking which I mean I guess is subjective so some people might not love that some people might like it though but I think you know it's just another one that's for $600 more expensive to have all-wheel drive and you know all that extra all those extra enhancements it's probably gonna make the Outlander a better buy as well in my opinion um, now the RAV4 Prime is still I think my favorite just again because it has the most punch um, and you have that famous Toyota reliability in that one but the problem is RAV4 Primes are still really hard to find and they are a few thousand dollars more expensive now with those with the fully loaded premium package that those have that's comparable to this you know being in the low to mid 50s now so you know that is the one that I guess is easier to kind of uh, discount just because again it's so hard to find them is that as far as the you know, inventory that is one of the thing the inventory situation for these is you know pretty similar to like the Hyundai and the Kia uh, but still not as plentiful as the Outlander either there seems to be more Outlander plug-in hybrids out there than basically all the other competitors so it'll be easier to hunt those down now you know your individual deals as far as incentives for plug-in hybrids in your state and as far as what kind of a deal you're able to get at the dealership and all that you know is how you know pricing will vary so you know I can only compare MSRPs because it's impossible to say what everyone's deal is going to be uh, but I would just say that you know um, this might not have as many deals as the Mitsubishi it seems like they're a little bit more aggressive with their incentivizing and stuff so uh, you know again pricing is gonna be relative but it just seems like this is basically the same price as the all-wheel drive nicer competitors um, while not giving you anything more and so that's really the biggest problem you know I think if this vehicle was priced appropriately I think that it would make a lot of sense and especially again if you live in a place where you don't need all-wheel drive I think this is a great little vehicle on its own and yes it's not perfect it certainly has a few shortcomings like I mentioned but you know I think that if this were five grand cheaper then this could really be an interesting alternative but as it is you know I mean maybe some people can get five grand off and then that can make this an interesting alternative but as it is right now again at that MSRP price that I have to judge it at it just doesn't make sense in the context of its competition and so unless you can find a huge discount on one of these to you know make it impressive and you know undercut the rest with the pricing otherwise I just think the escape is just dead on arrival unfortunately you know for this plug-in hybrid version even though you know again it has some redeeming qualities um, but anyway so that's all of my thoughts here on the escape plug-in hybrid let me know your thoughts on it in the comments below huge thanks to Ford for providing me here with this escape plug-in hybrid to review for you guys today and yeah thank you all very much for watching and I'll see you on the next one. Take care.